And may God give us grace to follow that example. But those men of God have gone before us. Take your Bibles and open, if you will, please, to the book of Malachi. And turn to Malachi chapter number 3 for just a moment. And uh, good to be here. Good to be saved. I don't know anywhere I'd rather be than here this morning. Unless it be in home with the Lord in heaven. Amen. And that's why we're here, because that's where we're headed. One of these days soon, and very soon, we're going to see the Lord. All right, I want you to have your Bibles there in Malachi chapter number 3. Let's stand for just a moment in reverence to the Word of God. And I want to begin in verse number 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come. Now you see all that business in those verses about he shall come and about the forerunner coming to prepare the way before him. And then the Lord says, it's me. I'm the one that's coming. Amen. I'm glad this morning I know who Jesus is. And then it says, but who may abide, in verse number 2, the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And we have dealt in some measure with uh, the thoughts in verse number 2 or the picture in verse number 2. Oh, notice one word, if you will, in verse number 2, and that's the word like. And any time in the Word of God you see the word like or as, you can set up and take notice because the Lord's about to paint you a picture. He's about to give us an illustration. And the book of Malachi has several pictures of the Messiah who is to come, the Lord who is to come, several pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's pictured in verse number 2 as refiner's fire. And then he's pictured in verse number 2 as fuller soap. In verse 3, he's pictured as the purifier of the sons of Levi. And all the sacrifices they ever offered, they could not purify themselves. But one day, the purifier came. Amen. And then in chapter 3 and verse number 16 and 17, he's pictured as the heavenly jeweler. Amen. He's going to one day come and make up my jewels, he said. And then in chapter 4, and I want to read here this morning. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble, and, that, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. And then I want to call your attention to verse number 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall. Now you can be seated this morning. And in chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse number 2, we find given for us here in the, the prophecy of Malachi another picture of our Savior, another picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we see him as the son of righteousness. The S-U-N is a picture of the S-O-N. Amen. And if we want to learn more about the S-O-N of God, then we can look at the S-U-N of God because God himself called him the son. The psalmist said, The Lord is my shield and my son. And the Old Testament Period. They were looking for and waiting for the coming of that son. Now look back in Genesis chapter 1, if you will. Genesis chapter 1 and go to verse number 14. In Genesis 1 and 14. And I want to look here for the message this morning. While you turn, let me pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to be one more time an old-fashioned camp meeting. And Lord, let me just pause just now and confess my inability to preach the Word of God. And I pray, O oh Lord, this morning that you'll cleanse these hands, that I might handle 
with holy hands the holy word of God. And I pray this morning that you would cleanse our minds and hearts and prepare us now to receive the holy word of God. Help us, Lord, to see your Son and our Savior. Help us to love, to see Him more clearly and to love Him more dearly. And help us to be determined to serve Him more sincerely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now in Genesis 1 and verse number 14, God said, and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now, reading verses 14 through uh, verse number 19, we have the account of that fourth day of creation when God caused the sun to appear. So in, when in Malachi chapter 4 and verse number 2, we are told that the, our Savior and the Son of God is going to be a son of righteousness. Immediately our attention goes back to this time and to the first mention of where God made the greater light and set it in the heaven to rule over the day and to be a light for man. And God said, he's like that son. My son will be like that son. And I want to, this morning, for a little while, examine that S-U-N and see if we can get a picture of the S-O-N, the Son of God. I want to begin by saying that the Son has a triune nature. We mentioned this yesterday when we talked about the fire. And you know, it's true. The sun, within the... Uh, the ball that we call the sun, there is the photosphere and then the chromosphere and then the core of the sun. There are the three areas there that make up the sun. Uh, just as when we talked about the fire, we talked about the spark and the oxygen and then the fuel for the fire. And that's a theme that's reduplicated over and over again throughout creation because creator, creation bears the mark of its creator. And the Son speaks to us of the triune God. I think about 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, probably one of the most hated verses in all the world. It's a verse the devil hates. And all the new versions have eradicated it, but thank God it's still in the blessed old KJV. Amen. And it says there are three that bear record in heaven, and that is the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so in the nature of the sun, there are those three areas. But when we see the sun in the sky, we see one light, pure and bright, the oneness of that triune sun that God placed in the heavens. And then let's look at the residence. I like that word you use, Brother Biddle, of the sun. The residence of the sun or the origination, the place, the seat, the home of the sun. It is in the heavens. And Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse number 12, He said, You are from beneath, but I am from above. You are of this world, but I am not of this world. And so He is the Son from heaven. Verse uh, Corinthians 15 says, The first man, the first man, Adam, was of the earth, earthy, but the second one was the Lord from heaven. That's pretty plain, isn't it? about who Jesus is. And so his residence is from heaven and that's where he came down from. Notice also the uniqueness of the Son. And that simply says there is only one Son. You know, I, I've seen some of these science fiction movies that are supposedly the setting is on some planet off in, the, uh, in some other galaxy and there are two or three suns up in the sky. Well, that's just not how it is. There's only one. And John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him alone, not some other Son, but in Him, should not perish but have everlasting life. 
John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one way because there's only one Son. We also see the preeminence of the Son. And what I mean by that is the, uh, the fact that it is the largest, brightest object in, the, in our sky. It's the largest thing there is there. Even though it's 93 million miles away. Think about that. The sun is all the way up in heaven, but he's still the biggest thing on earth. Amen. Yes. The largest and the brightest. And when he appears on the horizon, all the stars disappear because he outshines them all. Oh, yes, he does. We think about the preeminence of the sun when we think about the, the mass of the sun. The mass of the sun. Did you know that the scientists have somehow calculated the, the material that things are made of and the density and the size of the planets and the sun and the moon and the earth itself? And did you know that in our solar system, if you were to put all the planets and all the moons and all the asteroids, if you would put them all on the scales and weigh them, do you know how they would measure up to the sun? Listen to this. The sun is 99.7% of all the mass in our solar system. And everything else, all the other planets, the moons, the uh, uh, the asteroids, all the material caught in their orbits is only 0.3%. You know what that means? That means he's almost everything. And we're almost nothing. In fact, the truth is he is everything and without him we are nothing. And without him we can do nothing. And if you'll look at where the sun is, you'll find that he is the center of our solar system. In other words, all the planets revolve around Him. It all revolves around Him. Amen? I mean, they, they used to think in the old days that the earth was a center and everything had revolved around man. And man still thinks that. It all revolves around Him. But the Word of God has news for us. Amen? It all revolves around the S-O-N, the Son of God. And he's supposed to be at the center, isn't he? He's supposed to be at the center of my life. He's supposed to be at the center of my family. He's supposed to be at the center of our churches. And he should be at the center of our nation. That is his rightful place. It all revolves around him. Notice also because of the sun's, the sun's size and density, you also see the sun's gravity. In other words, because of its magnetic power. Because of its magnetic power, it holds all the planets where they are. If it were not for that power, the planets would go slinging off into the into outer darkness of the universe somewhere. But the sun is holding it all together. Amen? As a matter of fact, on a small scale, if you know anything about your chemistry, you know about the atoms. We talked about those little atoms a little bit yesterday. There is inside the, the atom a nucleus, and then there's an outer shell. And inside that nucleus, made up of like charges, there is a power from within that nucleus that wants to force it to explode. And then on the outside, in that outer shell, there is another force attracting it that is trying to pull it apart. Every atom of every piece of material in the known universe is trying to push apart and at the same time is trying to pull apart and there's really no reason why it shouldn't all just explode. And the scientist's only answer is there must be some unseen force. There must be some unseen power. That's holding it all together. And I know what that power is. Amen. God hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son, by whom also He made the worlds, who is the brightness of His glory and express image of His person, 
upholding all things by the word of His power. The Son is holding it all together. Amen. And then let me say something this morning about the power and the glory of the Son. The Son is like a huge atomic furnace. It's like a gigantic nuclear reactor. There is such power on the face of the sun that it's hard for our minds to comprehend it. There on the face of the sun, hydrogen is constantly being converted to helium and helium back to hydrogen. And it's like one tremendous nuclear explosion after another going on around the clock without end. And the temperature at the surface of the sun is somewhere near 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. You talk about power. And you talk about glory. You talk about brightness. Amen. And Jesus said that day when he led them out to Bethany and lifted up his hands to bless them, all power is given unto me both in heaven and earth and go ye therefore and as, and as you are going I will go with you I'm glad I'm on the winning side amen and did you know that of all the power that the sun has do you know how much of it we actually get on earth of all the power that the sun puts out every day only one two billionth of the sun's energy ever reaches the earth one two billionth of the sun's energy ever reaches the earth and it's enough to light up at the corner of every corner of the globe and it's enough to give light and life and to sustain every plant and every animal and every human being on the face of God's earth. He has all power. Amen. He is the omnipotent one. And then let's say something about the presence of the sun from where the sun is looking down on the earth the sun shines upon the whole world in a 24 hour period the sun shines upon the entire world in fact the sun's light goes out unhindered in every direction and not only is does he have all power but he is everywhere present Amen. There's not a place where he is not. And there's not a place where his light does not reach. No matter how low you are. No matter how dark your situation may be. The light of God's Son can reach down to where you are. I want to say something about the aspect of the sun. And that is from where the sun is. Now if the sun had eyes. If the sun had eyes, the sun could see every place on earth. Amen? And listen, the S-U-N may not have eyes, but the S-O-N does. And Hebrews 4 says, And there is nothing hid from his eyes. There's not a creature that's not manifest in his presence. He knows all about you. Whatever happens, he sees it. There's not a sparrow that falls from the heavens but that he knows. He sees all. He knows all. He is everywhere present and he has all power. He is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent triune God. That's who the Son is, the S-O-N. That's who Jesus is, amen. And then notice this about the Son. Notice his position. If you want to see the sun, you know where to find him? You, you, it's with, it, it never fails. Look up. He's always up. He's up because as, the, as heaven is higher than the earth, so his ways are higher than man's ways. Amen. I like the Old Testament where Moses took the serpent and put it up on the pole by the serpent of brass and said look up and leave and he's also up because and brother Biddle uh, mentioned this a moment ago because God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow you don't look down at the sun we look up to him notice not only his position but notice his path 
The sun comes up in the morning in the east and then the sun will cross the sky and will set in the west. And you can watch the sun every day and it'll come up in the same place and go across the sky and set in the same way. And if you go out there someday and you look up in the sky and the sun's turning loop-de-loop, we're all in trouble. If you go out there someday and the sun is zigzagging across the sky, you've got a problem. The sun travels a straight path. And you say, what is, what's, what is that? That's not crooked. Amen. I'm going to tell you something about the S-O-N of God. He traveled the straightest path that's ever been walked through this world. Amen. And Peter said he left us an example that we should follow in his footsteps. He never varies. He never veers from the pathway. It was straight path for his feet. If you'll look at the moon and if you'll examine the earth, both the, sun, both the moon and the earth have a dark side. But the sun has no dark side. No, and James said this about him. James said this about him. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow or turning. You can search all day. You can search your lifetime. You can search forever, and you won't find any darkness in him. John said this is, then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness. And I like that good old southern phrase at all. <laughs> Amen. That's what Pilate said. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. And the third time he said I find no fault in him at all. Nothing wrong with Jesus. Tempted in all ways like as we are and yet without sin. And when Judas came back and brought the temple money and cast it into the floor, he said, I have betrayed. Now you notice this. I, I read that a lot of times and read over the most important word in that verse. I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now his blood was innocent blood. But Judas prefaced that with the innocent blood. The only innocent blood there's ever been. He had betrayed. In him is no darkness. Amen. In fact, the sun never moves and the sun never changes. And the only reason nighttime comes is because the earth turns her back on the sun. And you turn your back on him and you'll be in darkness too. Hebrews 13 and 8 says Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Malachi 3, he said, I am the God of Jacob. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not concerned. He doesn't change. He's the changeless one. Now let me say something about the appearance of the sun. And look back, if you will, in Genesis 1 for just a moment. Genesis 1, I want to talk about the appearance of the sun. Now, it says in verse number 14, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, days and for years. Now, that word, let there be, I don't understand all about the original language of that verse. But there are those that tell us what that means is God caused to appear. He caused the light of the sun to appear on the earth. And the indication is that the sun was already there, you just couldn't see it. But on the fourth day, he revealed it. He caused him to appear. Now let me say this about when he appeared. Colossians 1 says he was before all things. And by him all things consist. But did you know that dispensationally he never made his appearance until the fourth day? Peter said a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And from Adam to Noah was just about one thousand years. 
And from Noah, Abraham was just about 1,000 years. And from Abraham to David was just about a third thousand year period. And from David to guess who? And you know, it doesn't say in, in Genesis 1 exactly when on the fourth day the sun appeared. But I think it was very late in the evening. Almost before the fourth day was ready to close. Because just as that 4,000 year period came to a close in the fullness of time, God brought forth His Son. Yes, He did. And there is no record in Genesis chapter 1 of a sun rise on the fourth day. But there is a record of an appearance of the sun and a son said. And do you know what the S-O-N, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, did on the fourth day? He made his appearance. The angels came down and sang glory to his name. And I'll tell you, he shined. Didn't he shine? Oh, he appeared in Bethlehem's manger. And then when he made his public appearance, he was shining bright. The Son of God, the light of heaven was shining bright. And Jesus said in John... Uh, 8 and verse number 12 I am the light of the world and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life and over in chapter number 9 he said I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day and the reason it was day is because the fourth day was already running its course and coming to a close and Jesus had to finish what God sent him here to do and so he appeared, and then he shined. And then you know what he did? He said. And you know the poets for all the ages have talked about the sun, and there's one famous poem that talks about the, when the sun was dying in the west. You know, that's exactly what happened to our Lord Jesus. On his last trip, and he had made many before, but on his last trip to the city of Jerusalem, do you know how he made his entrance? Through the eastern gate. Just like the sun comes up in the east. And through the course of his trials before the Sanhedrin and before Pilate and before Herod, and then finally until they led him out beyond the western wall, the sun rose in the east. And it set in the west. Before there was ever a sunrise, there was a sunset. That's what he came to do. He came to die. He came to give his life a ransom for you and for me. He came to pay the sin debt. He came to settle the accounts in heaven. Amen? He came to do the will of the Father. And so just near the close of that fourth day, he appeared, and he shined, and then he set. But that's not the end of the story. Verse 19 says, The evening and the morning were the fourth day. But if you'll look at verse 20 through verse number 23, guess what? The sun came up in the morning. <laughs> Amen. And he brought in, he rose again from the dead. And every sun since the fourth day of creation has been a risen sun. And every day the sun comes up, it is a testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ has been down into the jaws of death and Torn the bars away. And he lives triumphantly in power and glory. And he has the keys of death and hell hanging at his side. No wonder the psalmist said in Psalm 19 of the sun and the moon that they go through the sky preaching their message every day. And there's not a place on earth where their voice is not heard. He lives. He reigns. He's alive. And alive forevermore. And so he came up on that fifth day and brought in that day of grace. Amen. 
so that by grace through faith you and I might be saved, not of works lest any man should boast, because the Son came and set and rose again. Well, in the Son's rising, do you know what He does? He gives light and life. He gives light and life. Not only of light, physical light, but enlightenment. He brings light to the hearts of men. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 talks about when the sun, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, when He shined down. And then it also talks about when He shined in. I remember that night when that preacher was preaching and the light shined down. Amen. And singled me out. He said... Oh, buddy, God's looking at you. And then I remember when I fell on my face and opened my heart and the light shined in. <laughs> Amen. And that light was a life of God. In Him was life and the life was a light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. Oh, read John 1 and don't miss it. The light shineth in the darkness. And that word shineth is present tense, not past tense. It's not that the light shined in darkness, but it's that the light is still shining in darkness and the light is still giving life, amen, to all who will receive Him. It's a present, continued, ongoing action. He's still shining and He's still giving life. Not only does He give life, but He gives breath. Very literally. It's that sun, the light of that sun striking those green leaves on those trees that through the process of photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and turns it into oxygen that we couldn't live without. And Acts 17, Paul preaching on Mars Hill said, I want to tell you about the sun who gives life and breath to all men. Amen. And did you know this morning, if you're here this morning and you're not saved for the grace of God, the only reason you have one more breath and one more heartbeat is because of the love and the mercy and the grace of God's Son. Let me give you this quickly about the Son. Do you know what the Son does? 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, Apollos and I, we're ministers of Christ. One plants the seed, one waters the seed. But only the sun can shine on that seed and make it grow. It's God that gives the increase. The sun germinates seeds. That's very encouraging. Because that says, preacher, go ahead and keep planting. Go ahead and keep watering. Because it's not up to you to make the seed grow. But if you'll keep on planting and keep on watering, God will give the increase. And then not only does the sun make those seeds grow, but the sun directs growth. Now watch this. You'll like this. There's two forces in nature that direct growth. One is wind and one is sunlight. Now I've seen photographs of some of the islands, some of the Pacific islands, where the palm trees on the beaches there the winds are so strong that as those trees grew up, the wind kept them bent over all the time and those trees come up out of the ground like this, but then they're like this. They're almost out horizontal because they've been shaped by the wind. But there's another force in nature that directs the growth of plants and that's the sun. You go out here today, I challenge you to do it. You look at all these trees out here, you know where they're pointing. That's right. To Him. <laughs> They're pointing to Him. And you know what Paul said about being directed by the wind? He said, don't be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Don't let this world bend you its way. Don't let the perversions of this book bend you that way. You just keep reaching for the sun. You just keep looking up. You just keep traveling on. Amen. And you'll grow up unto Him, as it says in Ephesians 4, just like God wants you to. 
You let the sun direct your growth. And not every wind of doctrine. Let me say that the sun has healing power. You can have a wound and you could cover it up, bind it up, and, and put it under your coat and try to protect it and all that. And you know what will happen to, to it? Infection will set in. And it'll start to rot. And if you don't do something about it, you'll have a case of gangrene. But you can put it out there in the sunshine. And the sun will dry it up. And the sun will heal it up. And before long, you won't know it was even that. And he said in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bind up the broken heart. <laughs> Amen. To heal all the wounds. You might be here this morning and your heart might be wounded. You might be here this morning and your feelings might be hurt. You might be here this morning and you may be physically not well but I know someone who can make it all right. And he, when he gets through, you won't even know it ever happened. Like old Naaman, when he came up out of the river, his flesh was like the flesh of a little child. God does a good job, doesn't he? The sun will put strength in your bones. You know, we buy milk to get the calcium for our bones and for a healthy body, and they put vitamin D in it to make it work because it won't work. We can't store up the calcium without that special vitamin, but there's a third element you have to have, and that's sunshine. Sunshine makes your bones strong. You stay in the house all the time. You stay away from the sun all the time. You get weak. Paul said, for this cause, there are many weak among you, many sleep. Hey, we got a lot of weak Christians today. A lot of weak churches today. And you know what they need? They need to get in the sunshine. Spend a little time with the sun. Well, we were down in Memphis, Tennessee a couple weeks ago in an old-fashioned tent meeting down there. And on Wednesday night, it broke out. I'm telling you, heaven came down. Glory flooded that place. It was like a light came on. I kid you not. And I know the sun was there because the sun was shining. Amen. And when it was over, one of the old boys, hey, some folks got in down there that never got in before. Ain't that a blessing? And one old boy, when it was over, his face was all red. And somebody said, Richard, what happened to you? I said, he's suffering from sun exposure. Amen. Yeah, that's what we need. That'll put some strength in your bones. That'll make you. That'll give you some boldness to preach. That'll give you some boldness to wit to witness for the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong. How in the Lord and the power of His might. The Son's got drawing power. I don't have to tell you that. I mentioned already how he's holding everything there because he's pulling on it. The earth is where it is because the sun is holding on. Draw. Just like he draws the dew up and the vapors, he draws. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Quickly, let me give you this. The sun will affect every human being on the face of God's earth in one of two ways. The sun will either affect men like it affects wax or it will affect men like it affects clay. Now you can lay a piece of wax out in the sun and let the sun get up and shine down on it and you know what will happen to it? Not only will it soften, but it will melt. And it, listen, the Son of God's purpose is to shine down in your life and soften you and melt you to the will of the Father. So you give in and give up and surrender and go God's way. But if you turn from the Son, if you refuse to let Him soften your heart, you know what He will do? He'll affect you just like He affects a piece of clay. 
Some of you have been down into Mexico and some of the uh, third world countries and you've seen their homes made out of clay. But it's clay that's been laid out in the sun until it's turned into rock. Hard as a rock. And the sun will either soften you or the sun will harden. But the sun will affect every saved person like it affects water. Now, when the sun found you and me, you know where we were? We were frozen in condemnation. But he converted us. <laughs> Amen. Yea, he melted that old ice, that old hard heart of ours, and he converted us into something brand new. You get a new substance, don't you? Water. But you know when the sun shines on that water long enough, you know what it does? Not only does that water undergo a conversion, but it undergoes a change. Hallelujah. The first time I met him, he converted me. And the next time I meet him face to face, he's going to change me. And Job said, all the days of my appointed time, will I wait until my change come, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now you know how the sun changes water? It changes it into a vapor. And as it changes it, it lifts it up. And carries it away. <laughs> Amen. To where he is. Amen. And then notice this. The sun reveals the image that we shall bear. The sun reveals the image that we shall bear. Because you know what God was doing in sending his son? He's bringing many sons to glory. And Daniel chapter 12 says, And then shall the righteous shine like the stars. Well, you know what stars are? They're suns. You look up in the sky and you see only one begotten sun. When you see the sun, you only see one sun in the daytime. Well, go out there and look at night. They don't even know how many there are. Amen. And John, John said even the group he saw in Revelation 7 was a group that no man could number. And that didn't even include the rest of us. He's bringing many sons to glory. In Matthew 13, Jesus said it this way, And then shall the righteous shine like the sun. You know, there's a lot of heartaches down here. A lot of burdens down here. A lot of dark days and deep valleys down here. But one of these days, we're going to shine like the sun. It does not appear what we shall be like. But we know that when we see Him, we shall be like Him. I'll give you this last final thing today. Nobody knew this or thought or even thought about it until we developed the space program. And you know how they sent the little rockets up and up into the atmosphere and finally they broke through. They learned how to get enough thrust to break through the Earth's atmosphere and go out and orbit the Earth. And do you know what they learned after they broke through in the first manned mission and orbited the Earth? They found out that from up there you can see the sun all the time. Let that sink in a minute. There ain't no more sunsets up there. And once we get our change and take our flight and break through to meet the Lord in the air. 
so shall we ever be with the Lord. We'll never lose sight of Jesus again. Hallelujah. We'll be with him and he'll be ours to have and to owe forevermore. Bless his name. And Malachi said unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness rise with him in his name. God bless.